Hi, I'm Dan Cartapassi. Welcome to Layout Building. Uh, in this episode, I thought we'd talk a little bit about this module. Um, if you've watched any of my programs or seen my reviews, we, you probably know that I use this all the time to take thumbnail shots and such. Um, I've had this for quite a while now. I'm not sure when I built it, but it's probably at least maybe 12, 13 years old, uh, if not a little more. Um, it's built to Fremo standards. Uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar, Fremo is a modular standard that specifies the height of the module and also the end dimensions. Uh, this is the Fremo double track, so it's a 26 inch wide end. And uh, Fremo is pretty flexible, so you can, uh, it doesn't tell you how long the module has to be. You can make it any length you want. You can even make it curved if you want. It's, you know, you can pretty much have a lot of uh, freedom as the name might imply. Um, anyway, when I built the module, I thought it would be good to build it to some kind of a standard. And I chose that because I liked it better than uh, some of the others. Um, that's turned out to be a mixed bag in terms of usefulness to me. Uh, I'm not trying to say anything bad about Fremo. It's a, it's a great standard. Um, I just mean for my own purposes, there's a couple of things about it that might have been better if I deviated a little more from that. Um, now, if, if you're wondering, the, the module's actually not on its normal legs right now. Um, it's sitting on a roll around tool cabinet uh, because it's a little more convenient for me since I'm still working in here in the train room to be able to move it around. And it's, it, I didn't put casters on the legs when I built the uh, original legs for it. So um, it's a little bit hard to move. This also allows me to take it outside for natural light photography, which I do sometimes. Anyway, so I'm going to start with a quick tour. It's going to be fairly short because this thing isn't very big. Um, and then we'll talk about some mistakes and lessons learned. So this is the more scenic end of the module. It has a bridge and just the two main tracks. There's a little dry wash or dry creek and then a little culvert and a fence back there. There's also a hill and the foreground slopes down. So this is probably the more photogenic end of the module. In the middle here, we've got some turnouts. There's a crossover between the two main lines and then also a couple of switches to get onto some secondary track. The turnouts for the secondary trackage have operating switch stands. So at one point, these little switch machine castings were on the crossover turnouts because these would represent turnouts that are remotely controlled by a dispatcher. Um, unfortunately, I've knocked them loose a few times. You may see as we go along that the layout's a little bit beat up. The bridge is a Southern Pacific design ballasted deck trestle that I built following an article in Mainline Modeler from a number of years ago. It's not meant to represent a particular bridge, but it does follow SP design practices pretty closely. There's a lot of nut bolt washer castings and other little details on this bridge. The retaining wall and culvert in the back was actually something that I scratch built for a previous layout and then transferred it over to this one. I made the culvert from some heavy duty tin foil that I pulled over the edge of a file to make it look like corrugated metal. Then I rolled it into a tube. The chain link fence is made from some commercial castings I don't unfortunately remember whose, and then some scale scenics micro mesh for the actual fencing material. There's a little service road on the back where I sometimes park vehicles. The turnouts are hand laid code 83 on wood ties and the rest of the rail is flex track. I use code 83 for most of the layout, but the spur track in the foreground is code 70. So the spur track goes to a non-specific industry. Uh, I used a little Walther's building as an office. As you can see, it's missing its roof right now. It's also been knocked off its foundation. I want to talk about that later. Also, as you can see the fence here, which is the same type of fencing I used on the culvert is kind of mangled. The loading dock is scratch built from styrene. I used some actual pieces of rail on the front for the bracing. This doesn't follow a specific prototype, but it is typical of some loading docks that I've seen. Most of the ballast and dirt on the layout is real dirt and real rock from Arizona Rock and Mineral. The trees in the back are from a combination of sources, including super trees and woodland scenics. Most of the trees are natural materials, either twigs that I gathered or from scale scenics. A couple of the trees have white metal casting trunks from really old woodland scenics kits. I don't remember whose telephone poles these are, but there's five of them on the layout. Unfortunately, one of them on the end got broken. The little post with the orange top is a gas line marker, I believe. I've seen these a lot when I'm out rail fanning, so I wanted to include some on the layout. The spur track in the back could be an interchange or also just a storage track. In addition to ground foam, I also used some static grass in the layout. There's a little clump of it here in the front. I really like the way it looks. I'm looking forward to using more of this on the permanent Donner layout. So here you can see the fascia. I've got a throttle holder, and there's a loco net port for Digitrax, and then also a control panel to control the turnouts. It's just push button controls. 
There's actually an identical control panel on the back side, but I've hardly ever used it because I always operate the layout from this side. So there's four turnouts on the layout, but only three buttons. That's because this one here controls the crossover and lines both switches at the same time. There's really no reason that you'd only want to have one of these lined. In fact, that would probably cause a derailment. So the little shack has a LED for interior lighting. And then it has this, uh, this is actually a bulb, which is something I hardly ever use anymore with a little shade on it for an outside light, which is still working amazingly enough. So even though I built this to Fremo standards initially, um, I never actually took it to any meets. Um, it was just too much of a hassle to get it in and out of the condo that I was living in at the time. Um, they had rules about when you could use the elevator and stuff like that, and I just never took it anywhere until I finally moved out and we moved into this house. So it's still in pretty good shape. It's gotten a little beat up. There's some cracks in the scenery and some ballast missing in spots and the mangled fence and such, but it's nothing that couldn't be fixed. So this was never intended to be a standalone module. Um, I have another module that has no track on it. It never got beyond that stage um, that was intended to go with this one, but in the condo, I never had room to set it up, so I never built it. Um, it never had anything on it more permanent than Unitrack, and it was only used occasionally for like special situations to give me a little more running room for this one. Um, because of that, this one doesn't have a runaround track, and there's some other things that we'll talk about. So this module is 26 inches wide and five feet long. And those were pretty much uh, dimensions that I chose. The 26 inch width is determined by the Fremo standard, but the length was just my choice because I didn't want to make something that was too big to wrestle in and out of the condo. So let's talk about a mistake. Um, there's no backdrop on this. Now that was because of the Fremo standard. Fremo specifies that you're supposed to be able to access the module from both sides. So having a permanent backdrop doesn't really work. Um, however, for my purposes, again, I'm not trying to say anything bad about Fremo, but for my purposes, being a photographer and videographer, having a backdrop would be much better. Um, I have sometimes put a temporary backdrop behind it, but a lot of times I have to just, you know, work the angles of the camera and zoom in really tight. Um, thankfully, there's a hill back here, which helps, but it really kind of limits the usefulness of uh, the layout for photography because there's no backdrop. One thing about the Fremo standard that I really like is that it puts the main line in the middle of the module. And that's an idea that I've kind of carried over into my Donner Pass plan in a lot of places to have a lot of foreground scenery and a lot of background scenery. Um, it's really good for photography for one thing. And it's also good for your trains because if you have a derailment, it's much better if it falls over onto the scenery rather than taking a trip to the floor. So one of the mistakes I think that I made with this layout is putting a lot of details close to the front edge. Um, just like you don't want to have the main line really close to the edge, having details close to the edge is also not so great because even if you're a careful person like I am, uh, eventually your elbow is going to hit something. That's why the fence is so mangled. It's, you know, this layout's been moved. Uh, you know, sometimes you grab something in the wrong place or you're operating a train and you just, you know, don't remember where your hands are and it and then you you know you've wrecked something that took a long time to build so i would highly recommend um, you know putting detailed stuff set back a little from the edge so the fencing material around the culvert in the back is the exact same stuff that i used in the front but that's still in perfectly good shape back there and it's because it's set back uh, there's really not any reason to reach back there unless i'm you know doing maintenance on the layout or if i'm posing a vehicle on the little service road for a photo Otherwise, you know, my hands didn't ever go back there, so there's very little chance that that's going to get damaged. So another lesson I learned is having a short length of track in front of a turnout. Um, the switch here that goes to this little nondescript industry in the front, um, there's only enough track in front of it for an engine and a 50-foot boxcar, and basically a short engine like this GP35 here. Um, you know, bigger engines, not so much. Um, that means that if I want to work this industry, Doing something as simple as like pulling one boxcar and spotting another one becomes a major hassle because I have to put one of the boxcars somewhere else because there isn't room to maneuver it. That's a very artificial kind of situation. In a real railroad, you wouldn't have that typically. Um, the main line would extend for you know, miles and they would be able to maneuver the cars just on one track without you know, fouling the other main line or doing some artificial kind of weird maneuvering. So this is something that um, it really bears thinking about. If you have any kind of a switchback situation or a Y with a tail track or a yard with a yard lead, 
um, you really want to make sure that you have enough maneuvering room to make that track useful. Um, and I've seen this even in plans that have been published in magazines sometimes, that they'll have some really short little stubby track. You know, I saw one, I remember some years ago, I saw one with this little short little stubby track that looked like it was about one car length, where these five yard tracks that were super long came together. And if you can't use that little stubby track to maneuver, then the length of the yard tracks doesn't really do you a lot of good. Now, I have been on Google Maps and I've seen at least one situation where there was a track like this. It looked like maybe the track had been longer at one time, but it had gotten cut back, but there was still like one industry there that they were servicing. So I guess they must have to do some funky maneuvering to service that industry, but that's not very common. And uh, it brings up a point that I don't think that you have to make switching artificially difficult. You don't have to create switching puzzles. If you just lay out something the way the real railroads would do it, uh, you'll have fun for a long time if you like switching, and I like switching. So I think it's, uh, it's important. Now, as I said in the beginning, this was never intended to be a standalone layout. And if I had built the other module, then this wouldn't really be an issue because there'd be more track in that direction. So another thing that I'm calling a mistake is poor quality bench work. Um, I'm pretty handy and I have a lot of tools, but when I was living in the condo, all of those tools were in storage. So I basically had to build this with hand tools. I had to do it inside the condo. I didn't really have a good work environment and I couldn't get the best wood. You know, like nowadays I'll go out and buy a nice four by eight sheet of plywood that's of a really good quality. This I could only get small pieces because I had no way to get in and out of there. Um, and whatever wood this was, it wasn't as good of a plywood as I would normally use. So uh, the, the upshot of all that is that there's actually a sag in the middle of the track here. And um, if you have a really free rolling freight car, which I don't have out right now, it will actually roll to the middle, um, which makes switching operations kind of a pain. Also, um, you know, this works fine as a little standalone diorama where I'm running the trains around at a scale five or 10 miles an hour. But if this was going to be per part of my Donner layout mainline, it's just not acceptable. So if I'm going to use this module as part of my Donner layout, I'm going to have to completely rebuild the mainline for sure. So I've said this before in other layout build shows, but it really, really pays to have good quality bench work. That's your foundation. And it's just like if you have a, you know, doesn't matter how nice the house is, if it's on a bad foundation, it might still get condemned because it's going to fall down. So, you know, it really is worth taking the time to build the bench work properly and make sure everything's straight and level. And if you've got grades, make sure that they're, you know, figured out and not too steep and all that kind of stuff. It's just, you know, it's, it's kind of not the most fun part of model railroading, but it is a really necessary part. So in the last little mistake I'm going to talk about for now is uh, the use of nylon monofilament line for the uh, wires for the phone poles. Um, as you can see now, there are no wires on the phone poles. <laughs> That's because over time they got taken out by stray hands. Um, also, putting the phone poles behind the main line is uh, generally a good idea. You know, if you have them in front, they're going to be in the way and you're probably going to hit them. So um, I did do that. At least they're on the right side of the track. But using the, the monofilament line turned out to be not such a great idea. Um, there's a stuff called Easy Line, which is flexible that I've used for some things. And I will probably use that if I ever restring these or to do any other power lines in the future, because if you hit it, at least it'll snap back and you have a chance that you're not going to break something. Anyway, so that's the tour. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you like this video, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned and thanks for watching.